It's a pleasure to be here. I'm Betsy Myers, and this is an incredible opportunity to be here with Denise Morrison, who's the first woman CEO of Campbell Soup. <laughs> and we were just talking behind stage that, I mean, all of us grew up with, mmm, good, mmm, good. It's just a part of our life. And I was telling her that my, I have a nine-year-old daughter when I told her that I had the privilege to get to, to meet Denise, she said, oh, Mommy, will you tell her that chicken noodle is my favorite soup, and can she send us some? <laughs> but we're here today with a great opportunity. Uh, Denise is one of uh, a handful of women that are leading Fortune 500 companies, and uh, there's only 14, I think, women uh, leading Fortune 500 companies. And what's really interesting about uh, her role is that she has been preparing for this role for many years. She started off at Procter & Gamble, then went to Nestle and Nabisco, and, when Kraft, and then Kraft, because Kraft uh, bought Nabisco, and then uh, she's been at Campbell Soup. And in October of 2010, she became the COO with an announcement that she would be taking over the helm as a CEO in August. And so what I wanted to ask her was how she navigated that time in her life and how she started to build the strategy uh, that what she planned to implement in her new role as CEO. Yes, it, I, I would say that the last year was in an incredible growth experience for me personally. Uh, as Chief Operating Officer, I had a brand new team. My boss was still there, who I had a, a great relationship with. And I knew that there were aspects of the company that really needed to change. So I used the time to work with this new team to focus forward on what are the brutal facts in terms of what we were doing right and what we needed to do differently. And we developed an entirely new strategic direction to take the company forward in the next decade. And I was able to work with the board of directors through many uh, or several board meetings to get their alignment on that strategic direction. And it was great. I mean, they had very constructive input. We built the relationship with the team. And so by the time I did get the nod on August 1st, we were ready to hit the ground running. And how did you do that? Anytime there's a change in leadership, you're dealing with a lot of people who are, I guess, anxious about the change. So how did you and your leadership implement this new strategy, and I'm assuming you're still implementing it, so that people felt clear about the direction as well as uh, motivated? Well, the first thing that we believe at Campbell's, we have a leadership model. And the first thing is all about inspiring trust. And even though I had worked with many of the people of Campbell's, there were also parts of the company that I hadn't worked with. So building that trust was really, really important. And then the strategic framework that the leadership team and I created did provide very clear, simple direction. And literally, uh, I presented that with the team to our, all of our global leaders, got their buy-in, both rationally and emotionally. And I am still pounding the pavement, going to plants, going to Australia and China and all over the world to Campbell Operations to talk about focus forward and what we need to do to drive profitable net sales growth. And how did you, in building your trust among the stakeholders, was it the, through your communication that that was that part of your strategy? To, I'm sorry. So in building trust, you were saying one of the big components of making change is building trust. Definitely. I mean, it, it's important that the board trust you, that, you know, there's all new constituencies in this role, it's constituencies that I had never really uh, dealt with before, such as the analyst community. I mean, and to be able to manage expectations in terms of here's the long-term vision for the company, and here are some of the steps that we need to take in the short term to be able to build towards that, that required an incredible amount of time and preparation and thought. Great. And what's really interesting um, about Denise is that she has a sister 
uh, Maggie, who is uh, the CEO of Frontier Communications, which was another one of the 14 women who are CEOs of the largest 500 companies. So to have a sister yeah. is amazing. This is the sister act. Right, and I was saying, I have a sister too, her name's Dee Dee Myers, uh, who was President Clinton's press secretary. So we, we both come from having relationships, and one of the things we were saying backstage is that there's something very safe about having a sister uh, in your business. It's a but nice I, support it's, system. It's a really nice support system. And what I wanted to ask Denise is, what was it from her family of origin and what she learned as a child that it gave you both your sister and sisters, because you have more than one sister, the confidence to take on these kinds of roles? Yeah. Look, I think confidence is something that you develop. And my parents were very um, disciplined and very strict, actually, about setting high standards and making sure that we were, from a very early age, setting goals and achieving goals. So for example, we had job jars where they would put our chores for the weeks in the jars, and we all had our names on them. They were mayonnaise jars. And we would come down and we'd pick out our chore, and we could barter our chores, but they absolutely had to be finished by the end of the week. And my father would talk about the fact that we were part of a family team and we had to contribute our role in the family. So there were business skills being taught at a very young age. Well, and I listened to an interview with, um, with Denise and Maggie, and one of the things you guys were talking about, how important your family dinners were to your upbringing. <laughs> Yes, I learned marketing at my dinner table. My dad was with the telephone company, and he would bring home like the trim line phone and ask our opinions on it. It was, it was really kind of fun. Because I, I think there's been studies done that show that families that eat together at night, as hard as it is in our world now, uh, how, what a difference that makes to children. I'm probably the only person you know that had to write a business plan to get my ears pierced. <laughs> and Bruce Springsteen's father pierced my ears. He was a jeweler. <laughs> um, one of the things I want to uh, ask Denise is um, you've talked about the pipeline and, and how women move up in corporations and you've talked about how as women we need to be strategic in how we look at our career. Uh, one of the exciting things is that you've been in the food industry your whole life kind of preparing for this job and I heard you say recently that women need to make sure if you want a C-suite job to get the operational uh, background for your career. So I wanted you to touch on that and how you were strategic in your career uh, and the decisions you made that kind of got you to this incredible position. Right. I've, I have found and I've done a lot of um, communicating and speaking with, um, with younger women. I have a, a passion for uh, that and I have found that most women have the paradigm that if I just work hard and I just deliver results, I'll get promoted and I'll live happily ever after. And it just doesn't work that way. I think it's important to recognize that hard work and delivering results is the rite of passage. However, it occurred to me that we're strategic about brands and we're strategic about companies, but we're not strategic about ourselves. And so having a literally a strategic plan for your career where you're the owner I believe is a tip I learned the hard way and actually applied it and it really, really works. It has to start too with declaring what do you want to be when you grow up? What is your end game goal? Guess what? You can change your mind, but if you don't know where you want to be when you grow up or when you, when you reach your pinnacle of your career, how do you know you're going to make the right choices along the way to get there? So it's simple logic of here's where I've been and the skills I've built, here's where I am today, here's where I'm going, and who can help me get there. And so that's just a more strategic approach to career. So can you share a little bit about, you know, as you kind of move through the food companies of your career, did you, when in your career did you think I'd like to be the CEO of I was very young. I actually decided, even in college, that I wanted to run a I, I didn't know about CEO at the time, but I wanted to run a large company. That's how I had framed it in my brain. And so, therefore, I never got really hung up on titles and levels. It was really more about getting the experiences necessary so that I could achieve that goal, but not only not only achieve it, but be good at it when I got there. 
And so I took my career path has been more of a zigzag from sales to marketing. I've worked in plants. I've worked, you know, with P&Ls, mostly operating positions. And I went out in the field. I've been in headquarters to have the variety of skills so that when I got to the top job that I aspired to, I would really understand how the whole corporation would fit together. So that's so important, I think, what you said about really being strategic about our career, not just letting our career happen to us, but being strategic. And I think it's a great way to think about it. Um, and so I wanted to move now to the issue of mentoring. Uh, because all of us who are successful people have someone in our lives who have mentored us along the way. And there's a new study by uh, LinkedIn that just came out that said not every woman has a, has a mentor. In fact, uh, one in five women do not have a mentor. And this is hard to believe, but almost 70% of women who have said they've never been a mentor for someone else said the reason was they've never been asked. And I know that mentorship has played a huge role in my life as it has with yours, Denise. And uh, you have talked about how Doug Conant, the, the uh, CEO of Campbell's before you stepped in, was a big uh, mentor in your life going back to Nabisco. So I wanted to ask you, you know, who mentored you and how did that impact your life? And then who did you mentor? Right. I, I would say that it, you, you don't have one mentor in your career. You typically will have several and they'll be along the way. And actually, Doug was an incredible, not only mentor, but also a sponsor, and they are two different things. A sponsor also is an advocate for your advancement with others, and that's really important. But mentoring can be also seeking out subject matter experts for uh, things you want to learn more about. Mentoring can take its shape in leadership development, and mentoring is also a give and a get. So in, in a lot of the people that I've mentored, I got as much out of that relationship as I felt like I gave to it. And so that's one of the bonuses. And I still do a lot of mentoring today. I have a lot of time for it. I think women in particular need to tell more stories and they need to pass on the learning to each other and help each other get ahead. And um, did, in your relationship with Doug Conant, did you, was this something that was evolved or did you seek him out? Or was it from working together that you developed this relationship? Well, I had I had the good fortune of. Okay. Oh. Close in. Okay. Okay. Oh, I had the good fortune of working for Doug. So he was actually my boss for many years, and therefore we had a a, a men, he had a mentoring relationship that way. I think one of the best tidbits he ever told me was, I was so results oriented and very transactional. He sat me down one day and he said, Denise, you need to start building relationships. And I had no insight into that. And as he talked me through it, it literally changed my life because I learned about the fact that your ability takes you so far and your relationships take you the rest of the way. Right. I mean, relation, we get, everything we get done in our career is through our relationships. And so what an aha for you and to change the direction of your career. Yes. One of the things I wanted to ask you was this issue of resilience, which we all make mistakes in our lives and we skin our knees and we, I think we become stronger for it. But when you're moving up in a corporation, and can you talk about how an example of how you might have skinned your knees and the resilience of how you got back up? And then with that is fear that we have many, we, ha we all have fear as women, and how you push through your fear to kind of get back up and keep going. Yeah, well, I mean, you, you don't have a long career without making mistakes, and I actually uh, remember my mother saying to me at a very young age, you know, if, if you aim high and it doesn't work out, get up, dust yourself off, and go on and learn from it. And so that's been applied many times in business. I mean, I can remember one situation where I had, um, I was working for Nestle and we, I was packing ice cream for another company and we, we had negotiated all the terms except that I was more trusting and didn't get a signature on the contract and something went wrong. And of course, uh, we had to have a very tough 
conversation. And ultimately, it had a good outcome, but I, I learned you never, ever do business without something in writing. And so that was the hard way. It could have been a disaster, but it had a, a good learning lesson attached to it. And when you confront fear in your life, is there, do you have a conversation in your brain about how you deal with it? With fear? Yeah, when you, if you feel fearful. Yeah, I, you know, I think that um, I, one story that I, I can think of is there w when I was um, with Procter & Gamble, I, when I was in sales, there was uh, a buyer at one of my customers who was fierce. I mean, he, I would shake in the, in the room waiting to go see him. And, um, and actually, what, what happened is as I went in and I, I stuck to my facts and I had solutions, et cetera, over time, that relationship built and I, I, he actually became one of my best customers. But I had to push myself to go right. in that room. He put me through the ringer. <laughs> right. we, so many of us have that. I love the quote from Eleanor Roosevelt that says, do the thing you fear most because that's the lesson that you need to learn. And the final question for you uh, is this issue of uh, balance that uh, we talk about as women, but really we, I think we have to take that word out of the equation. And you say, you talk about it from an aspect of an integrated life. Yes. And you also have said that you believe that at Campbell's Soup that you can have a flexibility and an integrated life at the same time though, having a culture of high performance. Yes. I, I think that setting up the paradigm of balance is a high expectation of perfection that can't be achieved. So I like to think of it more as a balancing act and that you live an integrated life of your work and your family and you work that out. And so what I'm trying to do with the leaders at Campbell's is be able to create a culture where you can have high performance but still have flexibility so that if you hire the right people, they can get their work done and they can still have a life. Right, so important. And, and the final just suggestion or a comment is, now you're the CEO of Campbell's Soup and what is your strategy for getting more women up the pipeline uh, for more opportunities for women in Campbell's Soup? Well, I think we have some great women at Campbell's, and uh, a lot of them are here today. I'm so happy about that. We had a nice breakfast this morning. But I do think that, um, you know, it, it really is about giving women and men the opportunity to achieve their best work and their full potential. And we work hard as a company on a culture that enables that. And so I expect that women and men at Campbell's will achieve uh, really, really high standards. Great, well it is a privilege to be sitting here on the stage with you today, Denise. And I wish you every luck in your new role and uh, thank you for this conversation. Well thank you so much, Betsy. Thank you.